Hey everybody, Ivan here. Very different sort of video today. So this is something that YouTube Terms of Service shouldn't object to, first off the bat. What we're going to talk about today is how exactly I made you know, the shooting range, how, how it's built. A lot of people have asked this question because of course this is a, you know, a backyard range, so to speak. And so uh, you know, people have been you know, asking, you know, how, how, how do I have that? How do I have build a backyard range? How did you build yours? These sorts of things. So I'll preface by saying, you know, between me and my family, we've probably built four shooting ranges set up more or less like this. You know, across our history of building shooting ranges together, you know, t at least since I was born. Uh, this one, of course, I had a hand in building because look, it's mine and I can shoot. Uh, as far as geographical restrictions, right, right off the bat, the you know the legal stuff. You of course should check with your local zoning laws as to whether or not it is possible for you to have a shooting range. I am in unincorporated county land, which means that you can have a shooting range so long as it's in a safe direction and it's like a, some made up number of feet away from your neighbor's house. And as long as you're not doing it you know, before dawn or after dusk so that it would be a noise violation sort of thing. So of course check your local ordinances. If you're in a place that is generally sort of rural and you call your zoning board and ask them if you can build a shooting range, usually they'll give you a straight answer. Uh, if you're in a place that's maybe not as pro-gun uh, and you call your zoning board, they'll probably send the cops to your house. So of course don't make that gamble. If you're like, can I shoot in my yard? And if somebody picks up the phone and is like, guns are bad, of course be aware of the fact that cops may show up. On that same note, the cops have shown up here to my little range twice. Both times it was because somebody new moved in, because of course you can hear gunshots from a surprising distance away. People don't realize sometimes. You can hear gunshots from you know, miles away. And so we, we assume somebody new moved in because there was a house for sale in the area and they hear you know strings of gunfire and they're like, oh my God, that's horrible. Uh, in one instance, it was a family that had moved to the US from Chile. And I'm sure whenever you live in Chile and you hear rapid gunfire, it means that somebody has been done up. So they called the cops. Cops came out here, had a friendly chat with them sort of showed them the range and they're like, cool. Uh, and one of the cops even admitted he wished he had something like this in his backyard. So see, not all cops are bad, just 99.99% of them. <laughs> anyway, let's, uh, let's get to uh, more serious stuff here. So the basic way that this shooting range is constructed is we took railroad ties. So railroad ties are harder to find these days because the EPA hates them because they leach tar and stuff into the groundwater. I don't care. But the uh, EPA makes obtaining rail ties harder. We found a lady whose husband collected rail ties. That's kind of an insane thing, I guess. But like the, the collection that he had was like probably like 20,000 railroad ties. It was like a pyramid 100 foot tall that went for like a quarter mile long. Weirdest thing you've ever seen. I guess if you work on trains, you've seen that before. Like if you work on railways, you've seen that many rail ties before. But normal people haven't, and that's a lot of rail ties. So we got some of the rail ties. And what we did was we built, you know, three posts, one, two, and three. They're buried down probably three feet, and we just did that with shovels. You dug a hole down with shovels and then packed dirt around it to get these upright straight. So then at that point, we set these ties up on top of them, and we used these little gusset plates. This is just, you know, b bullshit steel stock that we drilled holes and stick lag bolts through, just to sort of give it some amount of rigidity. And so that made our uprights. From that point, we then started piling in dirt. Some of this dirt mound was built here before. If you live in a place where the sort of geographical situation allows you to build this up against the side of a hill, then you don't have to do any earth moving, right? Of course, there is a ridge line back there that's like at least 100 foot tall that would sort of make this whole backstop unnecessary anyway, but redundancy is key, right? You want to see where your bullets are going, and we've had trespassers come out from right here on the berm before, as insane as that sounds. While I was here shooting, you know, a little kid's head pokes up right here, and I'm like, uh, <laughs> do you know you're trespassing? And that sort of thing, and they're like, oh, they didn't hear me shooting. I think that's a lie, because like, oh man, that was a terrifying, terrifying instance in my life. But that's why you would want something like this. While, while we could just yeet rounds into the woods, it's nice to have this because it saves idiot children's lives. And saving idiot children's lives is good. So, you know, this is what this dirt mound is built up here for. Uh, this was sort of like lime aggregate, and there's a bumper from a Dodge that washed down the creek one day. <laughs> so we put it up here because it's funny, but it's been blown down by the wind. But we had, you know, you know, built up this dirt. It's a mixture of rock and aggregate and stuff. Uh, you know, it's, it's rock and aggregate from some concrete that got busted up. That's a good thing to throw in with your dirt to help prevent erosion, but as well as it's just dirt. 
Of course, if you've got land, dirt is free. <laughs> it's everywhere. I have 458 dirts. But uh, otherwise, like you can just buy fill dirt. If you live someplace that's like relatively flat land, you can buy fill dirt, you can buy loose rock, mix them together. It'll make you something that'll last a long time. We haven't had to do any repairs to the dirt for a long time. And this is probably now the world's heaviest dirt by volume because it's probably like 50% lead at this point. And the cool thing about that is, you know, the bullets that land in the dirt end up acting as a bullet shield themselves. So it's sort of self-healing in that regard. Uh, and so once we had this dirt mound built up to about this high, we were going for a 30 degree angle and you can see it has sunk some as these beams have sort of sunk into the earth just a little bit. But we put this roof on here to prevent frag from going everywhere. And you can see this tie has been flipped over because it's, you know, it started rotting down there. But you, know, you can see all of that yummy yummy frag that gets stuck in there. And that's why steel plates are good because if that was your neck you'd feel okay. Uh, and so I think this tie may actually be one that we cut in half, it's purely from fragmentation, which is insane to think about, right, with how thick a railroad tie is. I believe that was the tie that we cut in half using this gong, because that tie used to be right here. And we managed to saw it in half with frag off of this plate. Now, of course, you know, this plate on this side doesn't look too shot up. <laughs> on this side, it's uh, it's been shot at least three, maybe even four times. And to further evidence that, this plate used to be, you know, dead straight. It got face hardened so much on this side from shooting it, it bowed. So that's a fun little, that's a fun little physics thing. You can show the material science, science guys and they'll get angry at you because you can call it shot peening and then they'll get very frustrated and then they'll go like, yeah, no, that's actually, that's actually kind of right. But that's pretty much the gist of this. These are not anchored in. They're just sort of laid up here. You know, rail ties across. As rail ties wear out, you can replace them with, you know, tree trunks. If you have uh, trees that you can cut down. Uh, this is all Osage Orange, which is very strong wood. It's technically invasive. Uh, it's very thorny. It, it makes thorns big enough they can go through tires. They're bad for dogs, too. They'll get in dogs' feet. So we don't like Osage Orange, so we declare war on it. It's also very good for warming your home, if you've got a fireplace. But Osage Orange uh, works very well as rail tie stand-ins. So you can see as these rail ties got tore up by uh, frag off this gong, we sort of you know, laid Osage Orange in here. Which then takes us to how it is that we secure targets here. So that's actually pretty simple. This is, this is into Osage here on this one, but the other ones can just go into rail ties. These are just lag bolts with a little battery impact gun. You stick lag bolts in there with chain, and then you put hooks on the chain, and then you weld the hooks to steel plates. Oh geez, I don't even remember where these steel plates came from. I think it may have also been some, you know, so that, that guy who collected rail ties, that these were sort of the plates that like switches and stuff for trains go on. But, uh, you know, of course we have a fair amount of steel here. Uh, steel can be expensive, but you, you should look for stuff that's, you know, scrap steel. So if you know a guy in town who's like a scrapper or go to a junkyard, you can find plate steel from instances like it was on a railroad situation and then they scrapped it. You can find steel cheaper than if you go to like AR500 and buy, you know, they're, you know, they're extremely marked up, certified, super good steel. So long as you don't care about pockmarks, right? Because I don't give a shit about pockmarks. Clearly, I'll shoot 308 and stuff that's, uh, you know, steel core, it, it metal targets because it's cheap enough for me to replace. And of course, this one's probably been shot in excess of 30,000 times. And, you know, it is pockmarked, but at this point, who really cares? Uh, and so the, the hooks then are booger welded on by a master booger welder. I mean, look at that. Camera might not want to focus on it, but those are professional welds. That's union quality right there. And so the same applies to all these. And of course, there's smaller targets, bigger targets. And then I guess that gets us to what happens when targets break. So this one was actually interesting. I put this on Instagram. I don't know if I'll get the camera to focus, but you can see that this hook fatigue cracked. So it had a crack open here, and then that crack took long enough to propagate that it got rusty all through there. And that little silver spot there on the top is what was actually holding it. That was the only bit of metal still connected when it broke through. And of course the reason that hook would fatigue crack is because you, know, you can do your little games where you get this I mean, this piece of steel is probably two, three hundred pounds at least, and you can get it swinging back and forth as hard as it can, which kills the hook. But it's fun, so we do it anyway. Uh, much beyond that, uh, one thing that you can do that's fun is once you shoot this much, is you can go digging in all of the dirt to find, you know, spent projectiles, slugs, as I've always had them, heard them recalled to, referred to as. 
Uh, and so you can collect slugs. And it's interesting because sometimes you'll find like a slug that's like, oh, that was from a nine, you know, that's a nine mil that I shot through an FGC nine. You can tell by the rifling pattern or that's a 32. I haven't shot a 32 in a long time. Or, you know, that's a 308, clearly a tracer because, you know, it's got a little bit of the, the, the little burn marks on the rear end of the uh, projectile. So that's also a fun game that you can do sometimes. Uh, Osage Orange Stumps, which you can see, you know, Osage Orange, if you ever tried splitting it with an axe, it's an absolute pain in the ass, which is why you should use guns to do it, right? Because guns just fucking splinter this shit. And so, you know, we, we set soda cans up on these and you can shoot soda cans, which is fun. And this is a gas tank from a 78 LTD. <laughs> Uh, it was leaking and we tried fixing it with guns and I don't know, I don't, we're going to put it back on the car and see if it holds gas. I think it might. I think, I think we might have like got the steel to fold over where it was leaking before, but it should be good now. And there's one such a soda can that you do shoot when you shoot them. And then these bowling pins, these bowling pins also wash down the creek. It's crazy. <laughs> I guess, I guess at some rate we must be downstream of some place where people dispose of very nice things to shoot at in the creek. So we shoot at them. And then brake rotors. Brake rotors are always kind of fun. Although it's interesting, right? Like, if you ever worked with brake rotors, you'd assume that they must be some sort of hard steel. They're like some of the softest butter steel you can imagine. They, uh, tw 22s won't go through them, but like 9 mils and stuff will break pieces of them off. And anything rifle caliber just punches straight through them. It's kind of interesting. I think that's pretty much all I can yak about with the range. I guess, I guess if anybody's curious, right? People have always asked, like, why am I shooting in a dump? That's not fair. And I guess it also reminds me, people on Reddit think that that's my neighbor's house because it's like maybe sort of house shaped. And so they've accused me of like shooting at my neighbors. I mean, I guess I guess like maybe if you were if you were blind and you thought like the gongs were windows and the frame was like the frame of a house. I don't know. Reddit, right? But here we've got some ice on some trash cans and the trash cans have soda cans in them, empty soda cans that you fill up with water from here whenever it's not frozen solid. And then whenever you shoot the soda cans with hollow points, they go it's very fun. It's very entertaining. It's a fun thing to do. Uh, besides that, I think, I think that's really all there is to talk about. I guess one more thing I could show you is you know, on, on the question of you know, fragmentation when you shoot at steel, you can see that all this wood is just utterly chewed to heck. I mean, look at that. Look at that. Oh yeah. Look at that dirty board, blocking all them bullets. And so, of course, with anything like this, maintenance will be required. And you can see this, this pocket sort of lines up with where that gong hangs. This stuff is just sort of put on as a nicety. Of course, like maybe if somebody was standing over that way, uh, this you know, fr frag would pose some slight risk to them. But, you know, this is a shooting range and the property is all... Another thing that some some places don't require you to mark your shooting range as a shooting range, like on the property lines, and that's not that's not the case for me. But of course, all of the properties mark no trespassing to keep idiot kids from like becoming dead idiot kids, which we don't want. That's bad. And so that's something that's sort of a, a due diligence thing, right? So if if you do build a range in your backyard, take some effort to sort of make that clear that that's what's going on, uh, just to avoid any weird accidents like that, right? Because if somebody were you know, walking over here while I was shooting, I would see them, but you know, in that weird instance, uh, having something like this in, in better shape than it is now is a good idea. This will be something that gets fixed at some point, but you know, it's, it's more or less vestigial. It's just meant to catch you know, like a big ricochet. Like stuff like this over, over 20 feet that way isn't likely to kill you or even really hurt you. It would just be uncomfortable. Oh, and maybe, maybe the final point there. Uh, people will ask, shooting pockmarked steel like this, don't you get ricochets? Yes, <laughs> that's part of the fun. And why you should always wear safety glasses. Anytime you're shooting anything, safety glasses are smart. Uh, but even shooting steel, especially, safety glasses are a must. I've had 40 cals come back, like, you know, I've been standing 30 yards back and been hit by half of a 40 cal that comes back 30 yards. Uh, I've been shooting 223s at 50 yards and had pieces of jacket come back 50 yards. Uh, if you if you shoot at harder steel than this, that's sometimes mitigated, but it can still happen. So absolutely wear shooting glasses whenever you're doing this. You know, I've got cuts on legs and stuff, especially if you're wearing shorts or whatever. Cuts on legs do happen from you know ricochets and splashback from these sort of things, even even at 25 yards, 40 cal especially, 40 and 45 love to bounce off of steel, and so you know piece of jacket will come back and it'll scratch you or whatever. Uh, you know, piece of the actual lead core of the bullet will come back and thump you in the chest. 
And so, you know, that's, that's not great when that happens, but of course you stand off to an angle. You never want to shoot steel dead on to minimize that risk. But as it gets pockmarked, yes, you will have some splashback. Is it going to kill you? No. Really the only danger it poses is if you aren't wearing safety glasses. So, wear safety glasses. See, I'm teaching you all how to be very safe. This video's gone on very long at this point. Uh, I guess if you guys have questions, you can ask them in the question section that's that way. You put your, and, 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 and then go with your question just like that. And then once you've asked your question, you can do a like and comment thumbs up. And besides that, I don't know that there's anything for you. If there's one thing I love more than anything I love, it's, it's American guns and German beer.